So bonjour, Denise Baxter, uh, Indigenous, Martin Falls, Nindonjaba, Makwa Dodem. Uh, my name is Denise Baxter. I am uh, originally from Martin Falls First Nation. I'm a member there. And I am a member also of the Bear Clan. Um, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, my current role at Lakehead University uh, for the full-time role is I'm the Vice Provost of Aboriginal Initiatives. And uh, a secondary role I have is also uh, teaching the additional qualifications courses for the principal um, PQP 1 and 2 online for the Faculty of Education. Aboriginal Initiatives um, has many um, arms to it. Uh, one of the pieces that we have is our support um, to the entire institution, um, to, I guess, all things Indigenous. So whether sometimes we're looking directly at supporting students, so we have a, a department called Aboriginal Culture and Sport Services, and we have a team of three right now that work there. And they provide all of the direct um, student support. So right now we have a staff who's working with a community member and students from the community to set up the sweat lodge um, today. And then tomorrow uh, we'll be hosting a sweat lodge, which happens every month. And so all the students, whether Indigenous or, or not, are invited to come and participate in that sweat lodge. Um, so that is one example of the kind of work that Aboriginal Culture and Support Services does. Uh, we also have counseling um, that's culturally um, grounded happening within that area. Uh, we have a transitions coordinator who works with students and does all kinds of different workshops on health and well-being. Um, on, we're working with the law school uh, Indigenous director right now to look at sort of um, so you want to go to law school series so that we can have uh, people start thinking about that in their first, second and third year so that by the time they get to fourth year and actually have to write their LSATs and do their applications, they've already had ample time to engage with, you know, what is the study of law? What does the career of law look like? What are possible career options? Um, they've had multiple time to practice those LSAT exams so that they're successful on their first write. So those are just some of the examples. We also have um, a staff member who runs a little team of students um, and it's called the Aboriginal Mentorship Program. So uh, Lisa works with faculties across the university and then works with school boards, First Nation, public schools, um, and even uh, some of the adult age schools in, this, in the system to look at how Indigenous traditional knowledge can be um, recognized or is recognized and how it correlates to you know, Western scientific knowledge for example. And so she travels around the region. She has regular um, students who she's hired through some student funding we have to go work uh, like once a week in with a particular class in the school. And they've done some really interesting work. Uh, the main goal behind that is to um, really work with all students. So say it's a public grade eight class, for instance, the entire class participates, not just the Indigenous students. So it's a learning experience for the teachers, for the school principal, and for all the students in that classroom to um, really see the validity and the um, integrity of Indigenous knowledge in an academic setting. And uh, also the faculty that work with us then help bridge those gaps with traditional knowledge keepers and elders. Um, they did a really interesting project at one of the schools last year where they built a birch bark canoe. But they looked at all the physics and the like the dynamics and the aerodynamics and the flotation and the traditional teachings of uh, the birch tree and um, harvesting um, roots uh, so that they could actually build yeah. their canoe. And then they tested their models. Uh, they built one model and they tested it here in our flu. So they actually, you know, shot it down through an actual sciencey kind of space. Um, but they got to go into the 3D printing lab and, and print their designs out. So it was really a full year piece, but I had a chance to go in on one of the days and they had two elders uh, with Fort William First Nation and uh, Fort William Historical Park who were there. And so they were also learning the language at the same time. So they were learning the teachings of harvesting a tree because you actually kill the tree when you harvest it for a canoe. Um, and so what's the ceremony um, involved in that? What are the, the languages? What are the mathematical concepts that you come across? So. It's really, really rich, but it, it's, um, it's about having, I guess, uh, maybe demystifying the academy for students, but uh, helping students realize that there, there really is 
a lot of um, Indigenous knowledge recognized across our institution in a variety of fields. Um, another piece that we do um, that we're involved in is outreach. So we have a coordinator and a chief who right now is actually um, part of the APSIP um, trail, I guess. <laughs> so she's working with other uh, post-secondary service providers um, who um, are Indigenous but also are specifically servicing Indigenous students throughout the schools in our region. And they travel all over the province uh, different weeks of the year in the fall. Uh, but one of the things that she does is really coordinate um, outreach for graduate students, um, incoming undergraduate students. And so right now she's working with our Indigenous learning faculty and um, our international uh, vice provost. And uh, we've applied for a grant to have five students go to Mexico in the fall. And so we just finished doing all the applications and writing the proposal for that. And uh, so they have applied to go, uh, Lakehead University is uh, part of something called CANMEX, where they have presidents from a number of, I think, 11 Canadian universities and 11 Indigenous um, intercultural universities in Mexico, and the presidents get together every year, and they alternate Canada, Mexico, Canada, Mexico at different sites, and they get together to talk about what Indigenous learning and Indigenous education at the post-secondary level looks like, might look like, what they've learned. And so we're um, hoping to send five uh, students from the Indigenous Learning Program down there to do some community-based research at the same time that this uh, conference is going on. So that's uh, another example. And then uh, another program that we have that our department's responsible for has an old throwback title, but it's called the Native Access Program, <laughs> so NAP. And so we have students, it's an access program, um, and right now it's uh, connected with the humanities and the, the arts faculty. And so that's where the program sits. But we have 22 students who've started this year, and it's a program where they move together as a group. The classes run between 10 and 2 every day. Um, and some of them are just for the group, but then other classes like uh, Indigenous Learning 1100 are they're part of the regular first-year student population who are taking that course. So it's about scaffolding some learning and some skill development so that when they take their three credits that they uh, finish from that program and move into first year, they already have three credits towards their first year and a solid grounding of how the university operates. Um, I, I think part of what we know from the research is if people are first timers, I guess, in like first generation in a system, um, they don't necessarily have any understanding of how the system operates. And success is always higher for those people that know how a system operates to be successful in it. So while we do our best to, I'm going to use the word, disrupt the system by really having people think about our practices on an ongoing basis and looking at where those changes uh, need to happen and how, how we can help that happen, um, we really want students to understand the processes of registration, um, ensuring what it means to, you know, ask for extension on assignments, things about it like our accessibility, um, finance, scholarships, like there's so many systems in a university setting that if you don't have a guide to help you navigate that, your success rate is not going to be as good. So that's uh, another program that we have here. We have a few structures in the university and one of them is called the Ogamawan Advisory Council and it acts as part of the um, three pillars, I guess, are three points of a triangle in our governance structure. So um, the OHEC is a, a committee that's made up of um, probably about 60% of community members are representatives from uh, First Nations, Métis, Inuit organizations. And then we have staff and faculty that also round that out. And it's an advisory council that provides um, advice and uh, directly to the president. As, as the other part of that is with the Board of Governors. So the three, those three pieces make up that triangle. And the OAGC, uh, we meet four times a year at a minimum, sometimes five. And really we look at everything to do with um, Indigenous programming, Indigenous faculty, hiring retention, Indigenous students, um, political landscapes happening in our communities. And uh, for me, that's a, a really important part of how we govern the university and the role that OAGC places in there. Um, the other piece that we have is an elders committee and we also meet, um, we meet five times a year, every second month. And the elders committee, everything goes through the elders committee, often before it goes to OAGC. So we have a, um, 12 elders that sit on that elders committee from around the country really, but they all live here in Thunder Bay now. 
And so we meet with them and we actually, like the academic plan review was the most recent meeting we had. So that they were the first committee that the vice president did outreach to through the consultation process of our academic plan and got some very um, pertinent feedback uh, to help along that process. So that, that to me is a, another important piece of that. Uh, we also are part of the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, so we have an Indigenous reference group, um, which has been uh, really interesting to work with and are actually, uh, we just had a report and a community gathering that happened um, together with that group. So I think, you know, recognizing the importance of partners in decision making is, is another um, important piece of, um, I would, of really making good decisions in education. On many levels, I think Indigenous education is really about how the lessons we were we were taught and the lessons we still are taught. And I'm um, going to just uh, digress to a personal, like a story at the moment. But when I think about this Friday, for instance, um, I have an elder coming to the house to share women's teachings. So she's coming. We'll have a you know a small feast. In, in our space, I have a few female friends who are coming over, as well as my two daughters. Uh, one of my daughters is currently on her berry fast as her transition to womanhood. She's 13. And my older daughter has um, already uh, completed that first fast, um, which lasts 12 months, or 13 moons. And so for me, a big part of Indigenous education is exactly those types of experiences. And they're the experiences of teachings that have been taught for a millennium. Um, they're teachings that are, that are taught to help you live your life in a good way. Um, they're teachings that are passed down orally from person to person. Um, and while you can read about them, you know, many teachings and, and some of the books like by Edward Benton Benai are, are out there, and Sacred Tree is another one. Um, so there's some great books that tell you about some of the teachings or share those but I think face-to-face -face and relationship learning for me is is one of the key areas of Indigenous education um, you know I, I think about growing up and and spending time out on the Albany River with my family and my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and cousins and and what life was like and I you know I remember asking my grandfather when I was young and I was old enough to take the canoe out on the lake to to catch fish and I had he said oh get some fish for dinner and I wasn't allowed to do the sturgeon netting I just helped with that um, but I did take my rod and rail to get some pickle and some speckled trout and I said well how many do we need and I remember him looking at me and he said well we'll just get enough and I'm like well how much is enough he said Denise there's six of us here just get enough for dinner and that was it. Off, off I went. And I think of what that means in terms of sustainability learning, in terms of harvesting, in terms of, um, you know, living in an ecosystem to ensure that that balance stays the same. So it wasn't, oh, I'm going out because, you know, the fishing limit is, you know, four or whatever. Um, it was if I caught a, a big fish and a little fish and that was enough to feed us, then that was all I needed. If I caught one bigger fish that was all I needed. If I caught three smaller ones, and if I didn't catch any, then we would eat something else for dinner, you know, so, but, but I think of those lessons um, of life, of, of, and those teachings that are all embedded within those kinds of experiences, and to me, that is what Indigenous education is. So how do you do that in an academia is, is a whole other kind of question, um, and certainly we have a lot of, um, I think really great opportunities as we think about what that um, decolonizing educational Western education looks like, um, how we bring traditional and indigenous ways of knowing into courses as we build courses from the ground up. Um, sometimes it's it's really, I, I, I hesitate to use the word indigenize because I mean, for me, that means kind of a layer on, um, but really I like to kind of start fresh, I guess. So maybe unpack a course and then put it over here and then start and build a new course with the community about what those courses are looking like. And so for my particular role, a lot of what I do is build programming um, with faculty, deans, associate deans, and First Nations and Métis communities so that we're building 
together through collaboration, new programming, new experiences, so that um, we're embedding those traditional ways of knowing and being at the at the heart of it and building the program around that. And uh, that takes time. It's not quick. Um, there's a lot of learning that has to happen. Uh, sometimes it's about structures and governance structures in the university and, you know, course hours and that type of thing. But also from the um, course building perspective, how we do that together. And that equal partnership and that sharing around the table together and, and collaboration is is really, I think, how we move forward with that. There's, I mean, obviously some great books on, you know, by Baptiste and Sheila Cote Meeks has written some stuff around indigenizing or decolonizing the classroom at the post-secondary levels. So there's a whole lot of things that can be read that academics have written who are Indigenous people. Um, but for me, I think it's much more personal at that face-to-face -face space. For me, I, I really see, gosh, I see things really changing because I see that change underway already. Um, I've had a chance to speak to some professors who are working at Lakehead University, and there's a, a group of um, Indigenous professors who are working with the First Nation community um, here locally to build a land-based um, Masters of Education program. So that's not, um, you know, it's not the university going to say to the community, here, we're going to give you a program. Um, it's really about people sitting down together and working through things and listening, you know, not just with their ears, but also with their hearts. And I think those types of um, relationships and partnerships that are, that are growing and, and really developing right now, to me, those are the kinds of things that I see Indigenous education really, or Indigenous people really um, lending a positive um, aid to the university, to have the university think about um, a learning opportunity to change, just change things moving forward. I mean, the reality is formal education is still recognized in many, many situations. And so we've been um, exploring through processes that will recognize traditional knowledge and experience within the academic setting. So that, that's also part of it. And part of that, uh, we, like the Native Access Program, for instance, is, is one of the ways that we do that um, right now. We also have our Native Nurses Entry Program. Um, and those courses are built, um, and we're built with community and, uh, and the research from multiple communities about what is necessary moving forward. Uh, one of the uh, other partners we're working with is looking to build um, a business program that meets the needs of the members of their nations um, so that people from their communities can have that, that learning but also connected to what they, they are learning and, and need to learn about doing business within their own communities but internationally and nationally as well. So really, um, I think personalizing education is, is probably one of the, the ways I see that moving forward.